A child's death that has haunted the town of Pekin for the past year. On November 18th, 13-year-old Robert B. was reported as a runaway by his mother. However, we have been in touch with the Illinois State Police and are in the process of entering information of a missing or endangered person advisory. And what happened to Robert B. brought people in Pekin out to search for answers themselves weekend after weekend. Thousands of leads poured into the Pekin Police Department. The search for the teenager coming to a halt on a hot July day when his skeletal remains were found. So the first thing I want to do for this episode is really look at the two prevailing theories that we've had come out here. I think is what we're seeing is there seems to be an abundance of evidence or circumstantial evidence, I should say, that kind of lend credence to these two theories. So I really want to kind of take a look at them and kind of pick them apart and see if there's any parts that don't fit with the actual evidence from this case. So we'll start with Kendra's theory. So are you ready? Yep. <laughs> as ready as you'll ever be? Yeah. <sighs> Sure. When did you hear about it? So probably about a year ago. Pretty much he fell down the stairs. He got pushed down the stairs. So that's when it was an accident because the little kid was this is, was annoying. T T Jonathan thought it was funny to get the little boy high, and then Teresa's like the, probably just trying to mother him, you know, and she, that kind of stuff, kind of take him under his wing. Randy tells me that I said, well, that the little boy was being annoying, you know. I don't know what was going on, but Josh pushed him and he fell down the stairs and he died instantly. They broke, he broke his neck. So the second alleged theory that's come forward had been around since even prior to Bonsai's bones being found. And that was that Keith Brackett might have allegedly had something to do with Bonsai's disappearance. Something interesting to consider here is that Keith Brackett's name continues to come up. So he actually lived physically about two blocks from Lisa's house and right in that neighborhood and was part of that community and a lot of people know him in that community. And then he had a relative that also lived out by where Bonsai's body was found. And it's about two miles from where Lisa lived and where Keith actually lived. So this property that he was found behind is one of his relatives and he used to mow the lawn there. How long had you known Keith Brackett for? When we moved to Pekin, I didn't know anybody yeah. in Pekin at all. And I really didn't know Keith. You know, I knew the kids hang, hung out at there that was only because he bought the kids alcohol, drugs, what weed if they wanted it, that's what they got. You know, he, I knew it was weird acting because he would wear pink Hello Kitty pajamas, paint his finger and toenails, pink or purple. So I knew right off the bat he was out there. And would you say that Keith and Lisa were pretty good friends? Yeah, we was, everybody was good friends with everybody. Okay. And I mean, that's how close we were. We, the whole South like called each other family because all of us kids took care of each other because, you know, we all had the same things in common. He started hanging out with kids that were too old for him. Here he is, 13, and you got 16, 17-year-old kids that want to hang out with a little 13-year-old kid. And they were putting stuff in his head, trying to teach him things that he didn't need to be taught. And then when I get kept in the dark about who he's hanging with and everything else, then it puts me at a loss because I don't know what's going on. I kind of think it's ironic here that Lisa's kind of blaming the older teenagers for influencing Bonsai poorly when it's Lisa who seemed to have introduced Bonsai to most of the teens that he hung out with. Lisa even had a teenage girl and her boyfriend living in her house when Bonsai disappeared. And one of these places that Bonsai was introduced to teens was at Keith Brackett's house. So not only did Keith live within close proximity to Lisa and Bonsai, but they were also friends with Keith. So although Keith was an adult, Lisa often brought Bonsai over to Keith's house where they would hang out with teenagers. So then when we step away from the Keith theory and look back towards Kendra's theory, she talks about Jonathan Tandy, who was only 17 at the time. And Kendra believes that Teresa Vansill and Jonathan gave Bonsai drugs the night that he died. Jonathan was sleeping with his mom or something like that, but it was just... 
You think Jonathan was sleeping with Lisa? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's where that's where it was. He liked older women. He was sleeping with her, Jonathan. Okay. And he's younger, and he's he's always with older women because he's. That's a whole other story. Another thing that's really interesting here is Jonathan had actually slept over at Lisa's a handful of times. So he was kind of bridging the gap between having a sexual relationship with Lisa, but also being a friend of Bonsai's. And at the age of 17, with Bonsai being 13 and Lisa being in her 30s, that must have been kind of an odd dichotomy. I think the main point here is both Keith and Jonathan Tandy were familiar with Bonsai. And so I really believe Bonsai would have been comfortable going anywhere with either of them. Now, I think it's important that we look at the location of where the body was uncovered and see if that uh, unveils any more thoughts for us about who might be guilty of this crime. The body was found on property owned by a woman who lives nearby, within a, a quarter mile or so. The property is off of Route 29, off of a, a dead end side road in a semi-rural area. It's behind a shed. So it was in a, uh, a hidden location, off the road behind a shed in bushes, okay? Well, that property is owned again by the, uh, a woman who lives nearby who has a nephew who, uh, according to the police, is involved in the investigation. When you hear the news reports, it talks about rural Tazewell County is where his body was found, but really it was found on the edge of Pekin and Peoria. It wasn't like 20 miles out. It was, yeah. It's really the edge of town. So yeah. that it was like, oh, okay, that's not that far. Yeah. Like That makes me feel it's more someone within rather than uh, you know truck driver coming through town or something I didn't know you know where they found him at I'd never been there didn't know where it was at I didn't find out until recently that Jessa and Keith Brackett used to take my son there when they would cut grass oh to the property he was found at yes so Jess's name didn't actually come up till later in my investigating, and she is a young lady uh, who lived with Lisa up until about nine days before Bonsai went missing. Um, it sounded like she had kind of lived with her for a couple months, but she hung out with a lot of the same people Lisa did. And I didn't even know where that was at. I've been to the, his memorial once, and a friend of mine took me because I had no clue where it was at. So she had to take me and show me where they found him at because I had no idea. So in Kendra's alleged theory, she really points a finger at Josh McCreary as being the person who eventually ended Bonsai's life. So now we need to find out what the connection is between Josh McCreary and the property that Bonsai's bones were found on. Well, luckily for us, we were able to track down a friend of Josh McCreary's who said he dated a woman who was actually related to the Brackets, and this was back in 2009, 2010. This friend went on to further tell us that not only was Josh familiar with the property, but that he also knew that the property had been abandoned. We took this one step further and we were quickly able to corroborate that he had been on the property, he had known of the property, and that he did know it was abandoned. So that definitely brings in some concern and now I feel like both theories again are easily in play. So one thing I think is really interesting about all this is Keith had been named a suspect even prior to the bones being found. So if you take the time to go through a lot of the Facebook groups that sprung up around the time of Bonsai's disappearance, you can see these posts basically accusing Keith Brackett. And a lot of times they use his names. Other times I believe people are substituting boyfriend, Lisa's boyfriend, as Keith Brackett. So a lot of people knew that Keith Brackett was numero uno as far as suspects go. And what's even more interesting is guess who was all over those Facebook groups right from the get-go? Teresa Vansell. So it wouldn't really be a surprise if Teresa knew who Keith was. The town itself has 30,000 people. They were kind of all living on the south side at that time, which is even a smaller community within that larger community. So there's a really good chance that they would have known of each other. So do you know if they ever hung out with Keith Brackett? Because he seemed to be into some of the same things with the drugs and stuff. Do you know if he was ever hanging out with them? Or uh, Yeah, no, no. No, I never, okay. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. That guy, <coughs> I don't even know who that is. Okay, okay. And I'm that circle, you know. Well, and he might not. It's just weird that he was on the property and he knows Lisa. That's the only thing. That might yeah. be the only connection is it was his family's property but and he knows Lisa. It could be as in it, maybe they knew that too because maybe Jonathan knew. Right. I think maybe it could have been a purpose. You know, right, that, absolutely. Could have been set up as a patsy. Yeah, I don't know it, that whole side because I just am familiar with what's, and I just I'll realize how close and like, I didn't know that that was even who she was, but yeah. it's just crazy. But Jonathan Tanney, he's getting nervous. He said he was questioning about her or something like that in the jail. 
And mm -hmm. I think he would crack too if he was in locked up or something. But I don't know where he's at, but I think he would crack. I think they would all crack. Yeah, I feel like it's this is a hard thing, especially if it was an accident. It's a hard thing to keep yeah. a secret. If it's not like five people decided to commit a crime together, it's one person right. holding one secret. Accident. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. And then certain people eventually are gonna be like, I, you know, I didn't even do this. Like, I don't want right. to be involved in this anymore. Right. You know? Like we, they had, yeah. That's what I think is happening too. Yeah, if you can find out anything, and I know it's like three years, so don't. Right. Well, um, he told me that he did tell me that they were. Be, I said, well, why would the little boy be over there? He says, because they thought it was funny getting a little kid high. Yeah, so he must have been so getting high. So, wow. Do you feel like all the stories kind of lined up the same? Meaning, like, did anyone say he died any other way, or no. it was it, always the steps? It, it was an accident, the way that, that they say it. But yeah. yeah, she said it the way she said it, and then he's like, and then he said it was, it was, I was there, you know, it was an accident. It was an accident. And I'm like, what do you mean an accident? And for a long time, I'm like, how how is that an accident? And also, when you think about it, they were all part of the drug scene. So now you're talking about even a smaller community within a small community within a small community. And then to top it off, Keith was transgender, and as some people have called him as odd. And so you have somebody who's walking around town wearing Hello Kitty pajamas and painting their nails, which might not be a sight you see very often in Pekin. So he probably stood out even more than, say, your average Joe. Now, granted, being transgender has no bearing on this case. I don't believe transgender, there's anything wrong with being transgender, and I don't believe it makes you a murderer. But is what it can do is make you an easy target. So I think really there are three possibilities here. Keith Brackett, yes, absolutely could have killed Bonsai. Um, Keith Brackett could have helped hide the body. Or Keith Brackett has been set up as a patsy, um, which being transgender, I feel like made him a really easy target. When you hear people describe him, they always describe him as weird or different. And if it's just because he was a weird dude, that's obviously totally fine. If it's because he's transgender though, then that makes me question if he's being targeted. We just need to keep an open mind that we have somebody who could potentially be used as a patsy or we could potentially have someone involved in the crime. So I think that we just need to kind of keep an open mind and really look at this evidence from um, an evidentiary standpoint and try to see what it means to this case. So I think one thing that's pretty clear here is Lisa and Keith seem to be pretty good friends. I've seen a lot of people refer to him as her boyfriend. I have absolutely found zero evidence that they were ever in an intimate relationship in any way. So currently I don't have any beliefs that they were ever in a romantic or sexual relationship with one another. So when people say boyfriend in regards to Lisa at that time, I'm never really sure who they're talking about. About. And the crazy thing to note here is Lisa and Keith were such good friends that Keith was one of the very first people Lisa called when Bonsai had gone missing. She called him to try to get him to help search for Bonsai. The problem was he said he couldn't help because he was going out of town. According to Lisa, she said he never went out of town though, so she found that a little bit suspicious that he wouldn't help her search for him. He has not been charged. What uh, we found interesting is that this man subsequently after Robert was found. I was charged with a burglary and he was free on bond and uh, he did not have permission to do this but he was found I think in Massachusetts. A warrant had been out for his arrest because he had fled on bond. How he was found I don't know but it's not very often that a man uh, on a burglary case is identified and, and brought back. It's like it's a burglary case. Now, if he commits a crime, if anyone commits a crime or, or gets encounters the law nowadays uh, with modern communication, you're going to learn quickly enough that there's a warrant for his arrest in Illinois. Well, he was brought back and a bond was set at $300,000 for a burglary. I cannot recall the, uh, the details of it, what connection this man had with anybody involved with B, such as Lisa B. Police won't say, but they say he is involved. What do you think it means that there was a uh, $300,000 bond? It's very unusual to set a $300,000 bond on a burglary case. Right. I think it's kind of been a prevailing thought throughout this entire case that Keith Brackett has been the cop's main suspect. And I can really understand that because there has been a lot of evidence that has come out in regards to Keith Brackett. But because they don't know for a fact it's Keith Brackett, I am concerned that they aren't looking into other theories that might be the answer to what happened to Bonsai. So now again, we have to kind of go back and revisit Kendra's theory. When she gave her theory, she named quite a few people who may have been involved or in the house or kind of familiar with the people at that time. We tried to track down every single person she mentioned. Some of them refused to talk to us. Two of them were in jail, but we were able to talk to a couple of them. 
And they all seem to be on the same page that some version of what Kendra told us was what happened to Bonsai. Uh, the girl that's staying with her now, Kendra, Jonathan, and um, what's his name? Josh? Yeah. We're all there. They brought him into the house and brought him downstairs to get him high. Um, what he heard, well, what Kendra had told him was that I guess he started getting really annoying and he fell and then I guess Josh jumped on top of him and started strangling him and ended up killing him. And um, that's pretty much what Kendra, and he said you heard the, the story from Teresa. Hello. Hello, is Teresa there? Yeah, that's me. Oh, hi, Teresa. This is Ash from uh, the Robert B. Documentary Series. Is this a good time to chat? Oh, hi. Hi, how are you doing? Um, yeah, it's fine. Oh, perfect. Oh, fine. good. I've been uh, wanting to I talk to you. I just wanted to, to um, tell you that I'm pretty sure I know who did that to him. Josh McCreary was uh, messing around her name's Kendra. And Kendra, I'm cleaning a house over there on the south end of Pekin. And I go in the basement, and this girl named Kendra, that's our drug addict, and also messed around with Josh herself, says to me after she shoots up, right in front of me, she shoots up, and she says, Teresa, you know who killed Robert, don't you? And I was just bullshitting her. And I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know who, because everyone knew that I was trying to figure it out on my own. Yeah. That um, She goes, well, Josh didn't mean to, Teresa. He just yanked him up by his neck, you know, and it was an accident, you know. He shoved him down the stairs at Jerry Birch's house. I think one thing that was a little bit concerning is their stories are very close, but there's just little details that are a little different. But I kind of equated to that, to the fact that they were all saying they heard of this second hand. But then that concern sort of fell away a little bit when Teresa made an extremely graphic video about what happened to Bonsai the night he disappeared. And although she kind of says in the beginning that it's like a vision that she's having in the bathtub. She's not really clear on that. So really it just feels like she's retelling what happened to Bonsai that night. I know what happened. I've thought about it all hardcore. I want to thank you. Cause you're the one who solved this case by lying your lying mouth on ashes to ashes. That's not what this is about. It's about Robert. I'm laying in the bathtub and I start dreaming. All of a sudden, I'm laying on Jerry Birch's basement floor. I'm like a rug. I see Robert standing there and he's just dancing around. Being autistic. Jonathan reaches over and hands him a hitter. Because he wants it. Robert smokes it, trying to be cool like the big boys. Well, he loses it. Josh is sitting there and he's all spiced out. You need to shut your friend up. Kendra's sitting over there shooting up like usual. Everybody's gotta be cool, right? Josh don't like repetitive noise. John realizes he's fucked up here. Robert is out of control. He's sweating, he's starting to feel sick. He's scared, he wants to go home. Jonathan's trying to tell him, no man, just sit down. You're gonna be all right. Oh. All of a sudden, Robert just drops. Jonathan's, oh my God, dude. What's wrong with him? Is he having a seizure or something? Robert's throwing up. John is over top of Robert. He doesn't know what to do. He's starting to gurgle in his own vomit. Josh comes out of his stupor spice. Hey, man, he's dying. I need to get help. Oh, no, no, no. Get him up. Get him out of here. Kendra's like, get him out. Well, Robert's shitting himself. Kendra's like, he's dead, dude. People shit themselves when they die. What are we going to do? We're all going to go to jail. You got to get him out of here. Everyone's in a panic. Josh gets up. Hey, man, he's faking it. He gets over top of Robert, he grabs him by his throat. 
So the video concerned me, but what concerned me even further is we actually interviewed two people who said that they had spoken to Teresa prior to the bones being found, and she had told them where the bones would be found. And because they didn't really give much credence to what she was saying, they kind of ignored her. But then when the bones were actually found where she said they'd be found, they found that highly concerning. And then Teresa went even so far as to go onto Facebook to tell everybody that she knew where the bones were. So it's really kind of bizarre that this person knows where the body is and nobody seems to be looking really hard at her as a suspect. All I know is the cops told me he was, he was killed somewhere else and placed where they found him at. They don't even know where, according when I, when I talked to the coroner, because I keep up to date with the coroner, they said that all they knew is he was killed somewhere else and placed where they found him at. They couldn't tell me when, how long he'd been gone, nothing. So they didn't know how long the body had been there. They just know it wasn't originally there. Yeah, they just knew it wasn't originally there. It had been placed there. And that they found a rope next to his body. And the same rope that they found next to my son's body, they also found the same rope in Keith Brackett's house. Because when the police searched Keith Brackett's house, the same design rope was found, but they couldn't positively ID it as the identical rope. Because they couldn't get no nothing off of the rope that they found next to my son's body. I just wanted to remind everyone to subscribe if you can. The money just goes back into us trying to solve these cases, so it goes towards a good cause. The show, of course, will always be free, but if you do have the resources to be able to subscribe, you will get to see episodes early, you'll get to see uncut footage, discounts on merchandise, and you'll also get to be part of our private subscriber Facebook group. So definitely subscribe if you can. You just go to the website, which is listed there, and you can subscribe right there. And we definitely want to thank you and appreciate everyone's support. Even if you're not a subscriber, we appreciate you watching and caring about these cases. Now, back to the show. And did the coroner say if the rope next to the body, was it definitely part of something that happened to him? Did they know, or was it just something? All they know is the coroner said he died of homicidal violence and suffocation. Homicidal violence and suffocation. Yep, okay. suffocation. They said he had been suffocated to death. Did they say what state his body was in when they found him? It was just all bones. All bones, okay. That's what I thought. Right. They said that they found part of him here at the side and then part of him over here. So they he wasn't even to, together. It's like they just took him and just threw his bones. Disregard for people for life somebody like that is is sick did you ever suspect that keith did anything after hearing some of that did you it, it made me wonder it made you it, wonder it made me really wonder because it brought me back to the all, all the comments when he always said that he liked young girls mm. well if he liked young girls maybe he liked yeah that's not a far stretch where keith stayed at it was his dad's house and they had tents out back in the behind the house, and they always slept in tents. The whole tent thing, he had a grad sale. He sold it to friends Yeah, with I mean, the that's missing really, rope. That's really telling, though, that it's almost like, okay, we all agree it's the rope, but now he's saying somebody could have taken it. Like, that's kind of crazy. Like, okay, so we're basically saying that it, rope came from that tent set But it's funny, and, and you got to sit and think where I'm at, and, it's, and I'm, I sit and think about this stuff, and this is what... We went over in meetings behind closed doors with Chief and Federal and State and Rainey, so many Seth, so many, you'll hear me say Seth, but it's Detective, it's Rainey, it's Detective Rainey and Seth. Yeah, okay. With Seth so many times and Josh from State that um, when they came forward, when them came forward and said, we bought his tent and the rope was missing. Yeah. She goes, I already contacted police. Yeah. Detective. So a lot of this information had already gotten to the cops even prior to us starting our investigation, but it really seemed that the cops always had their focus on Keith Brackett. I think one thing that's really concerning here is both of these theories seem to have evidence and circumstantial evidence surrounding them, and they both seem to kind of fit with what happened to Bonsai. So it makes this case even more confusing. 
One thing that we really want to do here is to get the police to really look into Kendra's theory. I feel like a lot of people have come forward with information regarding this theory. And even though it is obviously still an alleged theory, I think there's a lot of things that line up with what happened with Bonsai. So I really want someone to take a serious look at it. So what we started doing two weeks ago was a letter writing campaign to Luke Satterley, and he's the master sergeant of the Illinois State Police. And the reason we did that is I really want him to sit down and talk with me so I can show him everything that we've uncovered. We actually have more information than we've put on the show because of privacy and other reasons. I have chosen to not showcase that information. I would at least like to sit down with Satterley and go over the information that we have so that if it does seem viable, that it can be looked into appropriately. Unfortunately, I've only reached out to him one time without success. So now we're hoping the letters really bridge that gap so that maybe he'll talk to us to see the information that we've uncovered. So we'd really appreciate your help in this campaign. If you have just five minutes, we'd really appreciate you writing a letter. And it was really what we're asking for in the letters is please be re polite and respectful, but is what we're asking is that they look into other theories surrounding Bonsai's murder. And I really want to be able to just sit down with him for about an hour to go over the evidence we have. And I don't think that's a lot to ask after all the work that we've done. So if you don't mind and have time and can write a letter, we would really, really appreciate it. So episodes for the disappearance of Robert B will probably be coming out on a monthly basis now instead of every other week, only because we're getting less tips in and we are still looking into those tips. We have some other great leads that we are looking into. So we will show that in subsequent episodes. But we need time now to see if we can have any impact on the authorities to look into some of the other theories. And we want to keep going through some of the theories that have come out to see if we can find any validity or hard evidence that can't be denied or pushed away for any reason. So definitely please keep watching. We will continue to give updates on this case and we will put out new episodes when we have enough information that that makes sense to put out an episode. So kind of just be watching about once a month, we'll probably have an episode right now. And in the meantime, we do have the What Happened to Carolyn Blankenfeld season going very strongly. We're on episode eight of that. That series is getting extremely interesting. So I would definitely tune into that. Plus, if you're from the Florida, Alabama area, maybe if you watch the series, you might have seen something or heard something and there might be a tip that you have. So please, we ask that you watch these series. If there is a tip or information you have, we do ask that you come forward with that.